Welcome back, folks. This is the uh, Justice Oversight Committee uh, continuing our work. It's uh, September 18th. This afternoon, we're going to be spending time on Raise the Age initiative. And also, we're going to um, work with Ben in terms of going through the current law for earned time because we're going to make a recommendation at our next meeting. So I think it would be very important for people to understand what earned time is within the Department of Corrections before we have to make a recommendation. So raise the age. We have a long list of folks who are here to testify. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Representative Lalonde, chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Um, both House and Senate Judiciary Committee have been working on this. Representative Lalonde, as well as Senator Sears, I uh, did a lot of work this past session on the current status of Raise the Age. Um, so we're going to juggle a little bit in terms of the order in which people are going to testify. But we are going to start out <clears throat> with Eric to give us a brief summary of what Raise the Age is. So Martin, it's yeah, all sure. yours. Yeah, I'm great. off the hook. <laughs> I'm expecting a lot of questions from you. Chair. I'll just kick you under the table. <laughs> so uh, just, just, I know we have a lot of witnesses to get through, so I'm going to have it somewhat focused more so for the other witnesses, but from uh, Eric, we're going to hear kind of where, how did we get to the place where we are right now, just the, the legislation over the past few years. Uh, but then, then I will be asking, you know, uh, the next witnesses I will have up will be uh, the folks from the uh, Office of Child, Youth, and Family Advocate. Uh, what I'm mainly uh, going to be asking witnesses to testify to uh, is, you know, what are, why are we doing this? What is the benefit of Raise the Age, uh, particularly for the next step that is due to happen on April 1st of 2025, Raising the Age of 19? Uh, and then also, what are the impediments? And when we talk to DCF, who will go after the uh, child advocate, uh, really understanding what is needed uh, to be in the best position to implement this successfully uh, as of April 1st. But we're gonna start with some basic background and over to you, Eric, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you, uh, Representative Vaughn, and thank you to the committee. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council, here to talk for a few minutes with the committee as Representative Vaughn indicated, just to bring everyone up to speed again, and what the details of the Raise the Age initiative uh, actually are, substantively speaking. I actually have a, a little handout that I did just so that um, you would have something to bring with you in case when other witnesses are referring uh, to the history or to any of the details of it. So if you ever sort of uh, uh, need a as we say in the legal world, to have your uh, recollection refreshed, uh, you can turn to that little document. <laughs> Don't rely uh, on our memories. Is that what you're telling us? Well, I, I certainly can. Yeah, I need to have a piece of paper. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So the quick history uh, is that uh, uh, this Raise the Age initiative has been going on in Vermont really since 2018. So it's been six years now. The, the implementation date, the first implementation date wasn't until 2020. But the first legislation was actually passed, you know, six years ago, 2018. It was, it was uh, uh, Act 2001 of that year. And as you would guess from what the phrase raise the age suggests, the whole idea behind it is that it's uh, uh, an initiative to increase the age at which a young person who commits a, a criminal offense can be uh, charged in the family division rather than in the criminal division of the superior court. Now that makes a big difference as to where you end up if you're a young person, one uh, criminal division or the other, because as sure, the committee will recall, uh, we talked about this part before, the family division proceedings are confidential. They are not uh, uh, subject to being disclosed of the young person's name or to other proceedings related to what's going on with the young person. Uh, whereas criminal division proceedings are public, so that information will all be public. If you're in the family division, you have a case plan from DCF, and though you are uh, have a case plan worker who works with you, and that's a, an entirely different program than you would have if you were subject to the Department of Corrections, in which case you might be incarcerated. You would have an entirely different set of services. And uh, also very important is that uh, in the family division, if you're a young person who is going through, you don't have a criminal record at the end. That's what you would have in the, if you're 
charge that's an adult in the criminal division, there's a lot of collateral consequences that a criminal conviction can bring up, whether it's related to your ability to get student loans, your ability to get public housing, your ability to carry firearms, travel overseas, there are all kinds of implications out there. So it makes a huge difference as to whether or not that young person is charged in the family or the criminal divisions. And there are generally two factors that go into whether you end up in one place or the other. And the two factors are, what kind of offense is it? And how old are you? And it revolves around those two moving parts. Now, the raise the age part doesn't really deal with factor number one. It doesn't, it doesn't really address the, the type of offense. It deals with the second factor, which is how old is the young person when the offense is committed? But just to remind everybody, so that because this may come up, even though factor one isn't really a part of raise the age, which is the uh, what offense did the young person commit? You may recall the phrase, the big 12. I hope that rings a bit of a bell. So remember the idea there. Yes, yeah, literally. <laughs> I love that happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, what at least what we had always referred to as the Big 12 were, were 12 offenses that have been uh, uh, categorized by the legislature to be of a more serious nature so that if a person, at least a person 14 years of age or older, committed a Big 12 offense, they would always start the criminal division, or generally speaking, I should say, because there is another off-ramp for the state's attorney to bring a youthful offender proceeding in the family division. But generally speaking, 14-year-old or older, you commit one of the big 12 offenses, those offenses start in the criminal division. And, and I'm gonna have to get used to saying a different number because we've always said big 12, but just this past year, uh, the legislature passed, um, I believe it was uh, an act uh, 125, same one that you're about to look at as far as what this committee is supposed to be doing. It expanded that number to 14. It actually took one of the existing ones away, which was burglary, burglary into an occupied dwelling, and it added three new ones, which was, I think, was aggravated stalking, uh, uh, drug trafficking, and... Um, committing a felony with a felony. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, committing a, uh, an offense while using a felony, or using a firearm, rather. Yeah. So those are added. That leaves you with a final total of 14 now. So I'll have to get used to saying big 14, I suppose. Um, but that's just for background knowledge. The, bit, the Raise the Age initiative deals with the age factor. And so prior to uh, the Raise the Age initiative going into effect in 2020, and as I say, the legislation was actually passed in 2018, prior to that, the age cutoff was 17. So age 17 or younger. If a young person was age 17 or younger, and they committed a non-Big 12 offense, right? Remember, because this doesn't deal with the Big 12 piece of that. Uh, so that means everything else. Right. If it's not one of those 12 or now 14 listed offenses, any other offense, those offenses generally would start in the family division. So they would get all those benefits of confidentiality and PCF services and uh, case plans, that sort of thing. So if it's uh, if it was 17 or younger, and that had always been the case prior to Ray Day. Ray Day passed in 2018, and then as of July 1st, 2020, step one, or you might call it phase one, step one of Ray's age goes into effect. And on that date, July 1st, 2020, that higher age of 17 gets bumped up by one year to age 18. So at that point, going forward, if you committed a non-Big 12 offense, anyone 18 or younger would start in the family division instead of the criminal division. So, yeah, so it brings in a whole another universe of people who, in prior to that time, would have started in criminal court, not family court. So that was phase one of Raise the Age. Went into effect, as I say, July 1st, 2020. That same legislation that, that started Raise the Age, which was um, uh, in 2018, Act 201, had a, a phase two, step two of the initiative. And that was meant to go into effect two years later, two years after that, not till July 1st, 2022. And at that time, the upper age limit would have been increased by one more year. So it would go from 18 to 19. It went from 70 to 18 in 2020. And then on July 1st, 2022, it would go from 18 to 19. So at that time, if you were 19 or younger and you were committed a non-Big 12 offense, your case would start in the family division instead of the criminal division, where it had always started prior to that. So that was the initial schedule for the implementation. However, if you may recall, between those years of 2020 and 2022, the height of the COVID pandemic. So uh, what happened was that the legislature passed uh, in 2022 Act 160, and that bumped out by one more year, 
the implementation date of that phase two, that those 19 year olds got um, delayed by one year to July 1st, 2023. And this is all in case you're wondering, want to recollect this, it's on the first page, very bottom of the handout I passed out, kind of gives you proposed effective dates and how they changed over time. So that was the first time that the legislature extended that implementation date. The next year, uh, in 2023, when that was uh, phase, two, phase two was supposed to go into effect, uh, it was determined the resources still were not in place. So the implementation date was extended by one more year to July 1st, 2024, which would be a couple of months ago, right? Well, that's when it would have got into effect. And that was the, um, the second time that the legislature decided to delay the implementation date. Then this past year in the same act that I mentioned earlier, where the big 12 was expanded by three offenses, the legislature again gave uh, an additional extension. And this is uh, the criteria that we want to go over in just a minute are on the second page of the handout. So this was act 125, which uh, just passed this year and extended the effective date. You know, it's interesting as Representative Lalonde was mentioning earlier, this time not to July 1st of 2025, but to April 1st of 2025. That's a very significant difference because it leaves much less time uh, for there to be any further extension of that date. And uh, I think the members of the, this committee who were on that committee will talk about that, but so that, that was an intentional choice. And uh, that's what you have in front of you now. So this, uh, this next spring, April 2025, barring any further action by the legislature, that second step, that second phase of raise the age would go into effect, which means the 19-year-olds would then be um, going to the family division for non-Big 12 offenses. Now, in the meantime, this is the, we look at the legislative language that you see on page two. In the meantime, Act 125 also said, all right, between this past July, a couple months ago, and next spring, when this phase two is supposed to go into effect, we want DCF to be bringing five monthly reports every other month report to this committee, as well as a number of other legislative committees you see listed there every other month, starting on, and this is, uh, if you look at sort of just a, a third of the way down the page, the very beginning of that underlined language, on or before the last day of every other month from July, 2024 through March, 2025. So reports should be coming to you folks about the, and let's go down a little bit further. What should the report be on? You see, on its progress toward implementing the requirement of Section 7 to 11 of this act that, raise the, that the Raise the Age Initiative take effect on April 1st. So these are bi-monthly progress reports as to how they're doing about uh, getting the uh, initiative ready to be implemented and take effect next April 1st. So that sort of Lays the groundwork for where you are now. That, and you'll see that the, the bi monthly reports further down are very specific about some of the criteria that are supposed to be addressed. I can go over those if you want, or you can take a look at them on your own time, but just to note that they are, they are um, you know, quite detailed right now, what sorts of data the committee is looking to see uh, to, to ensure that the, uh, that the groundwork is laid, essentially, that the foundation is ready for, for this phase two to take effect in April. The kind of the background. Have you take any questions or any questions mm -hmm. from the committee? Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, right now, under Raise the Age, <clears throat> for those who are 18 years old or younger, if it's not a big 12 or big 14, it would start in family court. Right. Yep. The current status. Just to be clear, or the current status. And it goes to 19 on uh, April 1st. Right. So. Um, other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. A quick one. I'm somewhat familiar with this bill. Uh, <clears throat> is there something in this bill that we're missing in reference to? Okay, they're looking at April 1 of 2025 to raise the age to 19. Does it stop there, or is there a small print in here which is going to continue to go upward and onward? Because why are we raising the age other than a criminal record? What point then do we, when do they become juveniles? Up to what age? Well, I think, for this. yeah, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's statutorily, the legislature sort of making that decision. And that decision is, at least in terms of non big 12 crimes, that you'll be treated as a juvenile at a little bit older age than you used to. Be. Uh, but to answer your first question, first of all, that's a policy choice for you. But there is no other 
step three, as it were, or there's no there's no other th thing after the age 19. Now, that's not to say that the legislature couldn't make that decision sometime in the future, but there isn't anything right now. That's the end, the end of it. Thank you. Yeah, Tom. Um, is there a reason why uh, this paragraph was put in the last paragraph? <laughs> Failure to meet one or more of the progress reports or the elements. There's no reason to extend it. Is, is there a reason for that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's just the last extension you're getting and we mean it. That's what the reason for that is. It was part of basis and excuse not to go. That was exactly the thing. Particularly establishing a secure residential. So, right. well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a difference in submitting a progress report and actually achieving these things that are necessary in order to, right. to do it. Right. So, so you can't bail out. Right. It's not an easy bailout on this. So, um, all right. Thank you, Eric. And and I, I mentioned earlier, I don't think everybody's here, that we're going to skip around a little bit. Um, and uh, we're going to go to the director, uh, Bernstein, and Epi, and uh, if you join us. And as I mentioned before, um, probably not going to we don't really have time to go through your whole um, the um, PowerPoint that was provided. Uh, and really want you to address uh, two main issues. Uh, starting first of all with, you know, what are why are we doing this? Why what are the benefits of raise the age, and particularly for the next step, raising it to 19? I know you have slides that you did include uh, that address that, but if you could hit on that, and if you could address any impediments to getting there by April 1st, uh, that uh, that need to be dealt with. Uh, so that we were prepared on April 1st, 2025. So uh, if you could introduce you, yourself yeah. to the record and then, then and proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Bernstein. I'm the Child, Youth, and Family Advocate for the state of Vermont. And with me is... I'm Ron Lauren Dickby, Deputy Advocate for the Office of the Child, Youth, and Family Advocate. Um, could you actually share this show anyway? Sure. So um, share the show. Um, so... Um, I am going to put up our PowerPoint, but I understand the directive. Um, so actually, would you, um, Representative Lalonde, you would like to know um, what the benefits are of Raise the Age and, and why we implemented it and what the impediments to implementation are? Is that correct? Right. Right. Yes. Thank so um, Lauren's going to share our slideshow. Because I, I want to start with, um, we just hit a five. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, our office exists sort of to answer these exact two questions. And I wanted to put this slide up because, um, you know, when you talk about high level policy, um, systemic, um, reforms, and when you talk about impediments to, to, to said policy, I think our office, um, can bring quite a bit to the table and that's why we're here and we want to continue to do that. And especially after hearing this morning's testimony, which was really eye-opening, it's clear that revenue is a key issue here. And um, I wanted to say that I think to answer again, both of these questions um, that you posed, you know, we have real opportunities to continue to draw down federal, to expand our federal drawdowns. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think that's what we should be focused on, I, you know, raise the age, I think it's unquestionable that it's a it's a good policy and that it should go into effect. And then I think we should turn to, to the really thorny question of how do we fund, continue to fund these initiatives. And related to that, I wanna again raise the prospect of the data system that DCF is about to implement, um, which is called CWIS. And without going down that rabbit hole, I just wanted to say, um, I would encourage this body to take, um, to have, even though it feels like it's an internal procurement process at this point, I would urge this body to really push deeper into the data system inquiry. Um, and I don't want to take up more time talking about that right now, but I think there are a lot of questions that, that are worth asking of DCF at this point, because crucial to the in expanding our federal drawdown and implementing raising image is that data system. Um, so, okay. Um, I think the short answer to your first question is, um, there are some really, I'm gonna skip all the way to the end. There are some really solid reports here. Um, those charts that we'll come back to are from some of them, but 
this is the last page of our of our show, and um, these sources, um, especially number one and number four, um, are um, crucial to answering that question. I mean, there there was a the, the last source here um, report on Act Two One implementation plan report and recommendations from 2019 is one of the you know highest quality juvenile justice reports that that exists for the state of Vermont. Um, uh, uh, Karen Dastin worked on this at the state level. Um, we had the Columbia Justice Lab. We had Vinny Chiraldi, who is, you know, possibly the top national expert on these issues. And this report has both, you know, the um, the background as to why I raised the age, the national research as to why I raised the age, who's yeah. successful and is successful, and also has a really detailed implementation plan, as the title said. So um, I think that is the best way to answer this question. I mean, um, I'll say in shorthand. Uh, national data, we, we don't have good data for Vermont, which is an issue, and it goes back to the data system. But nationally, um, there, is, there are a lot of studies that show that um, treating juveniles um, with, in a way that recognizes cutting edge brain science reduces recidivism, among other things. It reduces recidivism and it keeps communities safer. So we don't come up here and proceed from the idea of kids should be in the community no matter what because they're kids, right? We proceed from the idea of the way to make everybody safer and also to preserve families and keep kids safe and recognize that children are children and their brains are not fully formed um, is to um, have policies such as are included in race age. And there's a lot of data on that with people with PhDs that I'm not fully qualified to speak on, but that's, I think, basic answer to that question. Um, and so um, uh, we can, I mean, maybe we should go back to the beginning of our, of our show just real quick. I'm not going to go through everything, but oh, well, actually, let's, let, let's go. Maybe we'll go fully backwards. Um, so how do we know raise the age is working, right? Um, this is some data from the Columbia Justice Lab report based on um, what was available to them publicly. This is not with any particular this is no, I don't, I don't believe there's any freedom of information request behind this. Um, and this chart shows, so there's two charts in our, in our slideshow that are available um, in this full report, which is on that source page I just showed. Um, so this is number of youth on probation is counted on one day each year. And essentially what this shows is um, that, that with the addition of 18 year olds in 2021, as the orange bars represent, um, Interestingly, the total number of youth on probation with DCF went down from at least um, the previous two years and was a little bit more than the previous three years than that. Um, what's, what's confusing about this is you'd expect if you're adding more juveniles in total, because you're adding 18 year olds to, to caseloads in theory, you, you would expect to see an, some kind of an increase, right? Which would be, which was sort of incorporated into the planning. What's odd is that it went down altogether. Perhaps it was a pandemic issue. Um, I don't know, but I think, I think the takeaway from this slide is the inclusion of 18 year olds on, on um, DCF probation loads did not overwhelm the system, right? Um, and then the other graph here is, again, it's, you know, correlation is not causation, right? We, we don't exactly know why this is the case, but this is, number of youth in DCF custody as a result of delinquency. And you can see, I mean, a lot of this, you know, the trends from 2009, you can see is really is, is the national trend in what I just said earlier about brain science, right? Um, I, I wanted to also say, um, I meant to also say before that just because of the way systems work, courts are often behind where the science is. And, um, you know, you see this across every area where, um, in society, the social norms change, even scientific studies show changes, and courts sort of take a while to catch up. You saw this with Brown versus Board of Education. You see this with, um, you know, with, with, with many, many policies that eventually get litigated at the top court. But the law is really, you see this with, you know, we used to uh, have the death penalty for, you know, a 14 year old in this, you know, in, in this country. Um, and, you know, that changed, but only gradually. So just, I just wanted to point out that what the court system says is, is not the same as what the current science is, and that's another point from that report. So um, I also wanted to clarify in terms of the data. So this, this slide shows you what we're really lacking, unfortunately, and I don't put this up here to vilify DCF in any way, 
But I do think that there's a real um, issue with this particular, um, this particular number that's cited. So this is on page seven of the first progress report that, um, that um, legislative council um, Fitzpatrick was just um, talking about in, in, in that report. And here on this page, DCF says, as of June 3rd, 2024, there were 170 youth on probation who were not in DCF custody, which is the population we proposed would shift from DCF supervision to barge. And then you can read this for yourself. It's, um, there's a lot between the lines here, but what to me this implies is that if Raise the Age goes through, you'll have 170 new youth uh, that are going to barge. And that's not true. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's only implied, but if that's what this is trying to say, that's not true. We asked for an age breakdown of this population because what you'd want to know is how many 19-year-olds, in theory, might come on to caseloads, right? It, it, really, you'd be wanting looking at the current adult numbers. Um, and I just think this, this is sort of a, sim a symbol of this whole debate, which is in terms of the impediments to implementation, um, I honestly, I honestly think a lot of it is just is sort of um, it stirs up other issues with the department related to staffing, related to funding, and all of those things. Well, not all of them, but most of them we agree. You know, we agree that DCF workers should have more support. We agree that there should DCF's budget should be raised. We agree that there should be more funding for barge. Yes to all of that, but that's not a that's not an impediment to implementation from our perspective. And I haven't seen any, any data from DCF that's relevant that shows directly that raise the age expanding to 19 year olds is a true impediment. And what we know from national data, so we don't have really reliable state data. What we know from national data is that in places where, um, you know, where um, policies such as raise the age has been implemented, the recidivism rates went down and, um, and, the, and, and the, the, the violent incidents went down. And the stats show, and there's a quote that I think I took out of here in the interest of time, um, that, um, that showed that most juveniles, I think it actually says nearly all, this is a Columbia Justice Lab report, nearly all juveniles who commit a crime um, don't, you know, are able to um, successfully move on. It's, it's the few that, that, that get in trouble repeatedly that are the issue, right? Absolutely. But when you're talking about a broad policy, if you recognize that most youth, once they're positively supported, can turn things around, that's crucial to our economic success. And you know, again, this morning, we don't want to put people in jail. And if we can avoid that, it's worth the money to avoid that. Question, Teresa. Um, sure. I just want to dig down a little bit on, yeah. on this statement in, in terms of the 10 to 21. I, I guess I happen to agree with you that it's not indicative of to me, it's not indicative of what will move from DCF supervision to BARGE. I mean, theoretically, the 10 to 18 year olds could already be right. doing that. Right. And of course, this bill doesn't cover 20 and 21 year olds. So there's, you know, there's, okay. it's a much smaller, or I don't know, I can't tell you quantitatively of the 170, but it's a smaller subset of that 170. Um, but I, I guess one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about, because you referred to, you know, this shouldn't be an impediment to implementation. Um, in, in their budget testimony um, uh, or information presented to our committee, DCF said that they require $600,000 for six new FTE family support workers and $925,000 for 9.25 um, FTEs uh, increase in barge in order to implement the 19 year old um, raise the age. Do you have any information that's contrary to that? Or, I mean, I, I think that, you know, what you're saying in terms of sort of like the overall issues yeah. with caseloads and things like that at DCF. And we kind of saw this, I will say, in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program where the administration tried to backfill things, tried to get more staff than were really necessary to implement CCFAP because they were already understaffed and significant areas. And we had to make a judgment about how many staff are really necessary to implement. But this is just data that DCF told us. What is your opinion about, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, $1.525 million? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question for DCF. I think I'll ask um, them too. <laughs> okay, I think, um, I, and I, you know, I don't pretend to, you know, know the exact numbers, but I, I do think that I do know there are a lot of vacancies now. And one thing that we've really focused on is um, 
with juvenile justice and child welfare is, you know, supporting, is, is making, helping DCF be a, a healthy and desirable place to work. And so, um, you know, I think that to the extent that we are at the cutting edge of policy and that we are, um, I, I think that people go to work for DCF because they want to work with kids and help them be successful and not fall down the deep end of the juvenile justice system. So I think, I think Raise the Age honors that. And um, I think like the, a holistic um, inquiry into your question is important, right? Like, again, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm a broken record, but the data system, if, if, a, if a DCF worker goes to work for DCF, whether there's a new position or in the current vacancies, and then the data system takes them an hour to enter anything, right? That's, you know, that's a problem. So um, I don't know if like, I'm not gonna get up here and say they have all these vacancies and, you know, and so therefore they don't deserve any more positions because- I guess what I'm trying to yeah. get at is, um, I guess I was inferring from the previous statements that you made that DCF wouldn't necessarily need new resources in order to implement this. And um, I, I didn't want to infer something that wasn't accurate. So I wanted, to, I guess I, I think we don't it, know. It might not be this number or that number of positions, but do you, do you believe that DCF one either can do this within existing resources or do you believe that additional resources because that uh, would be necessary? Because I, I think that's an important thing, you know, for us to data for us to have. And I expect that there would be differences of opinion between maybe what you would say, maybe what BSEA would say, maybe what the department would say. Well, I think the problem is we don't have, we're not looking at the relevant information in terms of data to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why I presented those things so far to sort of set the different parameters of what we do have. But, you know, I think we could do better in terms of like really directly relevant data because these conversations get smushed together. Mm -hmm. The facility gets smushed up and raise the age, exactly. right? Yeah. The, um, you know, the workforce issues get smushed up and that's understandable. But I do think that really, if we're talking about raise the age in and of itself, we have to be really clear and really specific. And, and you know, again, I would recommend bringing in the experts on that, including, um, you know, the, the folks who were on that, those previous reports. But I, I think Lauren also wanted to say something. Um, I, I think we're all asking really good questions, and, and I think DCF's doing their best to answer those questions with the data that they have. Um, I think what we're missing is the, the caseload analysis of what 170 youth look like if they were to transfer to BARGE. Also, what does BARGE currently have, um, and, and what can they handle, um, and then look at best practice to see what is the best case load amount for youth on probation and serving them in the family court, in the family system, and, and move from there. Um, but I think I agree with Matthew in terms of the conversations getting mixed up together, because I, I did hear Eric say, um, you know, the whole other universe of people, right, if we're raising the age of 19, like that's a another universe, but I'm also curious of how many are already being served under youthful offender status, right? And so I think we really have to be clear on the populations, the different populations that are identified in the juvenile justice system, and, and how do we separate them out and have appropriate caseload data so that we can make informed policy decision. Um, and, and I think I love the framing percent of the lines because I think one of the greatest benefits to raise the age is DCF is committed to implementing raise the age and they've they've voiced that for years now. And so I would like to support them in in the ways that they note. Um, I also know that based on research and best practice that youth that are served in their community by community providers are going to have, better outcomes. And so if we need to allocate resources and invest in BARGE to help DCF implement, um, raise the age, and then also, you know, work on the other populations that they are mandated to serve, then um, I, I would be in support of that. I think all of us. Yeah. And I wanted to clarify again, it is not 170 youth that are going to switch. And I think we need to know how many, right? I, I would be interested to know how many of these 170 were ni are 19, or at, at that point in time or whatever point in time, 19, how many are 18? How many are 17, you know, all the way down? Because 
there's a population that no matter what DCF is already serving based on current law, that's not on the community, right? So that would be up to 18. There's a population of 18 year olds that they started serving when phase one raised the age one to effect. And then there's another population of 19 year olds that they might serve that's really probably DOC data, um, right? And so, so you know, we need you to be mean, yeah, looking I was gonna at say, that. Being able to yeah. assess what resources might be necessary in order to fully implement right. this raise the ages. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. So I, I don't, you know, I don't have, I, I support the, I support the policy. Um, I'm also not interested in making a um, shaky situation worse. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I couldn't in good conscience say, you know, do this without additional resources. Um, and I think that that's important for people sitting around this table to, under, to understand uh, and our colleagues out there. And, and I, I don't hear you advocating for that. I just, um, I, so knowing mm -hmm. what, the, what the real universe is, is important to understanding what resources might, need, might be needed in order to um, fully support that. Yeah, I also wanted to zoom out and say, you know, um, Doing, there was a huge process again in 2019 and prior to look at all of this and to create the reasons for raise the age. And you all did your job as a, as a legislative body to now go back on legislation. Sure, it happens. But, you know, I think that's reserved for situations in which there's a real mistake or something wasn't taken into consideration. And we've been spending a lot of time. I mean, DCF in, in other avenues will, will, will say you know, if they're spending time on X, they can't spend time on Y. And, and I understand that. And I think to continue to ask them to create these reports and to, to come up here and continue to have hearings on legislation that, you know, I mean, you know, no offense, but I think we're, <laughs> we're doing a let's go job now, sort of doing this ad hoc and looking about whether to delay it than, than the original process. And so I would encourage everybody to look back at those original reports and look at why we have this, because I think Yes, the pandemic happened, but I, I don't think things are fundamentally different. And what we know about brain science, you know, if anything, it's it's affirmed, you know, everything that's behind raise the age. So before we go to uh, uh, Ginny Wines, j just to be clear, uh, I don't think we're looking at how, whether to delay. I think <clears throat> we're trying to understand what we need, perhaps in the Budget Adjustment Act, next year's budget. What does DCF need to be in as good a position uh, to get this going April 1st of 2025. That, that's our main purpose. Uh, and I, I appreciate that clarification. And, and I think, again, my answer to that is the data system, first and foremost, and don't wait, because it's, it's going to go the wrong direction if you wait. So I, I would, I'm going to ask a follow-up question and then to me, but, but just from what you said. So if that data system is not sufficient by April 1st of 2025, do we still proceed? Uh, absolutely. It will not be. It will, there's no way it will be. Right. right. Um, I do think we can make some temporary fixes, which is a separate conversation. Um, but that's, I think, back to the earlier question about that last phrase in the reporting bill, why, why it says these aren't requirements for implementation, because we don't want to be up here saying we can't implement this law until all of these things are satisfied. Right? Oh, sorry. No, good. You, you actually said what I was going to say, but, you know, having a, a system in place and then fi figuring out where we're, where we are in, in the, in the system development is critically important. And I know you've talked about the data uh, acquisition piece before and um, in, in, an, in another meeting, I know how important it is. If nothing else, um, that we talk about requiring additional capacity for facilities. If nothing else, it shines a really bright light on how we are working with the younger group of folks. And it, uh, it shines a light not just on those who are criminally in, or judicially involved, I mean, it also shines a light on others who need community services. So um, I'll just end there, but having the system in place to deal with. So um, we're, we need to move on. Um, the chair has given me limited time to get through oh, all my witnesses today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, our PowerPoint has other useful information. Yeah, I think that's very. Yes, folks, look at it. It's very very helpful. To, and Thanks for having us.
go to Commissioner Winter for <clears throat> having us ahead of them because they would have taken off. That was your first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever else you need, uh, Commissioner Winters. Uh, I'm joined online by Deputy Commissioner Radke and our Director of Adolescent Services, Tyler Out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So I think you heard the question. The main question, I guess, um, happy to hear that you uh, would understand the benefits and why we're doing this, but really want to, uh, with the time we have, understand what the greatest needs are uh, to be able to be in as good a position as we can April 1st, 2025. Thank you, Representative Lalonde. For the record, my name is Chris Peters. I'm the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. And I do just want to say up front that we absolutely do share the goal of uh, increasing the number of youths who avoid the criminal justice system and as a result can have a, a successful transition into adulthood. Uh, that said, we still will remain concerned, um, as you might imagine, with the impact that this will have on the rest of our systems, uh, our workforce, um, and our ability to care for the other children who are our responsibility. Um, because it was such a, a topic uh, from the previous testimony, I think I'd like to turn it straight over to Tyler Allen to speak a little bit about that 170 number, how we're looking at caseload and the pressures that we think we're going to see. We do have some additional information from our friends, the Department of Corrections. And, and Tyler, could you uh, speak to the caseload, please? I would be happy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen, for the record. Uh, I'm the Adolescent Service Director for Family Services Division. And I just wanted to clarify that 170 number was always referring to the potential number of youth who are the number of youth um, that are in, they're not DCF's custody, but DCF is supervising for probation, for um, purposes of probation only. And this proposal involves expanding our barge budget, which is the community resource that Deputy um, Director Habe referenced. Um, this is a community resource that we are proposing an expansion of that programming could offload a portion of caseload from DCF's existing caseload to free up attention for those custodial delinquents in our care. Um, and so it is not referring to 19 year olds or a new population that would come our way. It's referring to uh, youth that are already in our care, whether youthful offender or um, uh, or uh, as a delinquent, uh, as what's known as a delinquent, a youth with delinquency. We do have a little data to that. Um, we were able to pull some together from our friends at Corrections and using our own. Uh, a snapshot of the data, there are a total of over a two year time between fiscal year 22 and 24, there were a total of 38 uh, delinquent and, and YO cases of either 18 or 19 year olds in our care. So if we're looking at that population, uh, there are 38 of those over a two year time. Uh, those can be broken out by 18 and 19 year olds. Um, the major vast majority of them are for what we refer to as big 11, but what we're talking about today is big 14. I think there's a technical understanding difference, but if I slip and say big 11, no, I'm referring to what Eric uh, referred to as big 14. Um, but all but one of those would be, um, actually all of those would have big 11 offenses attached to them. Uh, 14 of them are 19 year olds, 19 of them are 18 year olds, either on youth, one youthful offender, one delinquent. Uh, for the 19 year old population of youths that are currently being served by the criminal division, this is DOC data. Um, there are a total raise the age population of individuals convicted in criminal division is 168 over a two year time. Um, which is probably more talking about what the population we are, although some of them um, could actually, no, no, those aren't the youthful offenders. Of those 18, there is one misdemeanor case and 31 felony case, which includes 20 big 11 cases or big 14 cases. Of 19 year olds, there are 79 misdemeanors and 57 felonies, which include 17 big 11 offenses. So the youthful offender conversation becomes relevant here because those are cases DCF is involved with um, and we do work with and have had success working with. Uh, so it is, it's, it's worth noting, but there is an expansion of population we're talking about here. I'd also like to point to the report that um, the, 
uh, OCYFA referenced the implementation report, the Act 201 report was a comprehensive, well thought out report around what implementation needs are. In that report was the recommendation that there was an expansion of DCF workforce, I believe to include six additional FSWs specific to juvenile services and two supervisors, I believe, attached to it along with that recommendation. That portion of the recommendation has not been realized since implementation. So that corresponds with one of the requests to expand DCF workforce. So those are two approaches to address the overall context of juvenile justice to make it so that DCF has increased resources to better serve those new populations coming in. I'd like to ask just a question about that last point, uh, workforce recommendation. Uh, why hasn't that been fulfilled? I think we've been hesitant to fill that or to try to fill that because we have a number of vacancies already. You know, it'll be very difficult to fill those positions. Also, <laughs> our position has been that we don't have the facilities and we don't have the data system. Uh, we don't have the other pieces to implement raise the age in the way that we would like to, the most effective way we'd like to, then it didn't make sense to hire any workforce for that. So there hasn't been the effort at this point yet because of those rationales? There's uh, there's always an effort to recruit uh, family service workers. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Radke can probably talk to you about the modest progress that we've made there, but we still have a high number of vacancies in that job class. Okay, All right, thanks. Just a yeah, quick follow-up on that. And kind of stole my thunder here. Commissioner, uh, during testimony this past session, there was several employees of DCF who come in, and, and you've stated that, just as you said now, that you couldn't fill position and so forth. So in listening to Tyler's uh, discussion on full-time full employees, and there was, what, nine or ten or whatever else, my understanding is the funding hasn't been provided for that yet? or That's correct. So why would you hire if you don't have the funding to begin with? In reference to Representative Lalonde's questioning. It's a good question. Um, I will, I know there was a question from the committee last time around budget and what might be in the in the proposed budget. We are, of course, can't get out in front of the, the governor on that. Um, we're in the middle of building our budget. This is one of the things that we're looking at are those positions and is also that barge, <clears throat> barge funding. Um, I can't make any uh, commitments today as to what will be in the budget, but you can see from the previous report that we did talk about, as I think Representative Wood was alluding to, I think it was six positions uh, at that time, and we were also looking for about a million dollars in increased barge funding to be able to support implementing the age. So those are the things that we're looking at right now as we build the budget. Well, and just, just as a follow-up question as well uh, from Senator Norris is, uh, whether the request for that funding was made by the administration uh, or not, uh, and if it was, what happened to that? Did the legislature not uh, agree with that recommendation? It was not requested. We put it, the House Human Services maybe put it in our yeah. budget memo to House Appropriations. Okay, but, but so it didn't get through. It, it was not requested by the administration, and then it was not approved by the House. Right. So, so, of course, we knew we were going to be extending. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I guess that's true. That was. Did we know at the time of the budget that we were going to ex extend this? Or well, I, 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 I can't tell you what you all discussed. Can I just ask a quick question? Please. Yeah. Please. So one, one of the things that I am a little confused about is, you know, um, if we are if, if under this proposal we would be transferring people to barge and that would free up actually caseload, why would you need six new caseload, six new family services workers if you're actually freeing up people um, by having barge um, supervise and support more youth? Why do you need six new? I'll, I'll defer to Erica or Tyler on that one. Uh, for the record, my name is Erica Radke, and I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Family Services Division of DCF. Uh, the reason that we would still need six additional workers, particularly those uh, workers that would still be devoted to juvenile justice related youth, is because we will still have a, a workload of those youth that are in custody, and because of the increased uh, demands that those youth 
uh, often bring with them as part of their case, uh, their work and case planning with them, we would need additional workers to do that kind of uh, support and services for them. So that was the reason that we uh, were requesting additional help. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, when we're talking about raise the age, it, it really is, we look at it as part of our whole system of care. And in terms of our workers, not only just do cases that would be part of raise the age, but uh, foster care, younger children, and really it's the instability in the system as a whole is what creates a difficulty for our workers and for our ability to get new workers. Uh, right now, uh, we do have, I believe it is 27, no, we have 23 vacancies right now. And um, that's as of last week. And then we have an additional 19 workers that have less than six months experience on the job so they can't carry a full caseload and what this means is that we don't the reduced number of workers and the increased acuity of the youth that we're working with and then the other issues as far as not having a secure facility all really combine to make that much more of a workload pressure on the workers that we have and that really does have a true impact on our considering whether or not going to the next phase of raise the age is really feasible for us. And um, we, we have been making some recruitment and retention efforts thus far. We've been thinking outside of the box and we have had some modest success with that um, that I'd be happy to go into at another time or even now, but I just wanted to make sure that we put into context when we're talking about workforce that it's because we're working with all of the youth in our custody that uh, the ability to, to serve each youth is impacted fully. May, may I offer up one sub bullet to one of the points presented by the deputy commissioner? Yes, please. Hearing nothing at all. <laughs> um, so there is an understanding amongst caseworkers of all types that 10% of your caseload accounts for 90% of your work. Um, those numbers change depending on the social worker you're talking to, but that seems to be generally true. And so when we're asking about an expansion of the barge budget and an increase in juvenile services workers, um, that's really coming to the idea that many of the folks we work with don't need the level of in intervention to have a full probation caseload go through when they can be working with a community-based provider who can kind of address all those needs without, you know, without really increased intervention from DCF for the majority of youths, which we would like to see expand. I think we would like to see that expand even outside of the conversation of raise the age. When we're talking about uh, the individuals who are, as Deputy Commissioner Radke referred to as being high acuity or having high acuity needs, they generate a huge amount of the workload that our staff are facing. And when we talk about 18-year-old and 19-year-old youth, we have some additional challenges working with them in that they have legal uh, privileges that other youth in our care do not have. And so, um, and it's very common for them to maybe have uh, less secure housing, more limited support networks in other ways. Needs are not being met. So there's more intensive workload associated with some of the transition age youth in our care who we do serve um, uh, associated with getting them through. And if they have a co-occurring legal matter that we're trying to address, it's hard to focus on the legal concerns of this individual based on the on the the life concerns of them in that moment of time. And so this would really apply more time for for our workforce to attend to those work uh, those needs holistically. Well, I'm, I'm confused. Has those six positions that would be needed, those have not been approved or established? They have no. not been established. Yeah. I just wanted clarity because I know the money wasn't there, but I wasn't sure if those positions had been approved. Right. So um, if you can proceed for, for addressing the other needs. I had a couple questions as well, but I want to make sure we have your chance to touch on other uh, issues. Sure. I think um, based on what we knew of what the committee was looking for, um, Erica could speak to workforce. You've heard our, our efforts there, um, uh, modest gains here in facilities. We hope that to have the Red Clover 
um, building in Middlesex open very soon. We're putting the finishing touches on that, working out some of the final details. Um, you know, we continue with the city of Virginia's on the Green Mountain Youth Campus and having uh, a lot of conversation with city officials and with the community there, um, but moving, moving ahead a pace um, with, you know, perhaps some slowdown in the schedule there due to um, having more stakeholder involvement and perhaps looking at some design changes. And some of that was based on the feedback we got from this committee last time um, in making sure that we are addressing potential 18 and 19 year olds in that building as well, um, and whether there could possibly be a separate uh, separate space, looking at the overall milieu of the youth who would receive treatment there. Um, it could be anywhere from 12 to 19 years old and how that's difficult and complicated to, to mix that group uh, together. And of course, Eric, uh, Deputy Commissioner or the uh, Director Allen could speak to that. Um, and then it's just lastly, I, you know, I think it's important for us to, to note and to point out um, some of the things that are working really well with 18-year-olds uh, and raise, raise the age and some of the challenges, uh, Director Allen uh, pointed to that a little bit in terms of their supports, uh, their stability, and their ability to tell us no and not engage in, in services. Um, and I think we should also be taking a look at uh, our, the Youthful Offender uh, Program and the, uh, the successes that we may be having there and the slight differences between that and raise the age. And I just wondered if, if we could just take a minute to have Erica kind of speak to um, the youthful offender program, uh, some of the challenges that we're seeing with 18 year olds um, and some of the successes that we're seeing with 19 year olds under YO status. Great, thank you. Sure, in, in terms of the successes, we've been able to uh, work with youthful offenders and uh, be able to place them in a return house. And we've really had some success with being able to get those transition age youth uh, onto successful adulthood with some supports and services just to get them uh, to the place where they're able to make those adulthood decisions. And really it's been, um, it's that intensive type of service that has been helpful when you get a youth that's able and really willing to accept that kind of help. But um, on the reverse end, when we're talking about the 19 year olds, particularly those uh, that may be a youthful offender or even those that would have, would be raised the age if we uh, at that particular instance, uh, because they're able to, they're in our custody, but not so that they can't, they can refuse treatment. They don't need to stay in a program if they don't want to it, because they are legally uh, they're of age. So then it's not as effective because they aren't uh, bound to stay within a program the way they would if they were a younger youth. And that does make it more difficult for us to to have that kind of uh, service success with them. So it's something that we are still really working with in order to provide them with the service that is helpful that they will accept. So that that's some of the challenge there as well. Questions from other folks? Um, so before we move on, just just uh, I, uh, really quickly, that uh, and we'll have a couple more witnesses and yeah, give me a little fine. bit more time. No, that's fine. Um, so, so we see this raise the age as not only having good outcomes for, for the emerging adults, and that's why really pushing to have this happen, uh, but also that it's going to help with uh, public safety because we get better results. The frustration and why I think you have the April 1st deadline is that we feel that they're not placing the blame with the DCF for folks that we have in front of us right now, but there hasn't been requests for the resources to, uh, we've known for years that the IT system needs to be upgraded for years. Uh, and there have been opportunities in the past to do that with significant federal funds, and, and it hasn't happened. You know, we've known for quite a while of the workforce uh, issues. Uh, we've known for quite a while about the residency, you know, the, having a placement for these folks. And, and it's a great frustration that there seems to be foot dragging, and I'm not placing that at the commissioner's or, or deputy commissioner's uh, level. Uh, and, and that's what's really frustrating. But we really want to 
stick with the April 1st and do what we need to do, uh, whatever the administration may be asking for in the, the Budget Adjustment Act, the next budget. Uh, you know, we can look at the 2021 recommendations and, and we can push ourselves, <clears throat> say that we need more money in barge, we need more money for these additional positions, we need to have appropriate resources to get this IT system up to speed as well. So, yeah, I, but um, the one other thing I just want to throw out there and, and, and don't have to comment on this right now, but one of our big initiatives in the uh, Judiciary Committees this year was uh, H645, I don't remember what act number that is, of expanding pre-charge diversion. And as that rolls out, we're hoping that more 19-year-olds, 18-year-olds, or actually all ages uh, will not be getting into uh, DCF, will be going through pre-charge diversion uh, or barge. Uh, so, and we'll see how that plays out. That's a little bit of your term as well. But uh, any other parting comments and we'll move to a couple. Can I just ask one thing? Yeah, yeah please. It's not really a question. It's like, um, you know, I appreciate the attempt to provide data in terms of the number, um, but we really are going to need a very much more concise breakout of the number of individuals that you would anticipate um, um, being impacted and how that will relate to either your request for resources or what, what the legislature may deem necessary. So, um, you know, the information that was forwarded here and, you know, just it, we need the category that really breaks out 19 year olds and 19 year olds that are in addition to what it is that you are already doing. Um, so I just want to be clear about data that we will need. Absolutely. The, the data drivers are key um, to our ability to implement effectively. And I think you'll continue to hear us <clears throat> say we're very, very concerned about the stress on our workforce and our systems and our ability to do our jobs um, if we add additional caseloads. So we'll get you some clarity on what that caseload looks like, not only the numbers, but the complexity, I think, as, as Director Allen yeah. referred to, what is the actual work involved with these individual? And I think as we heard with Department of Corrections earlier this morning, I think it will be helpful. And um, Erica didn't have a chance to talk about the, the methods that DCF is using to try to recruit and retain yeah. people. So it's it's uh, hard for us to make decisions about adding staff when you're you're nowhere near close to being at a, um, a staffing capacity that would be considered normal. Your vacancy rate's still very high. So, um, you know, we'll follow up with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, so we'll go to uh, Judge Zoni, and then after that, we'll go to uh, Tim Leaders Um Oh, well, Judge Zoni, thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's good afternoon. I know you're short on time, but Tom Sonet, Chief Superior Judge, do you have any questions? In what I've heard so far, as we know, this is a decision on Raise the Ages policy. Uh, I actually have reviewed the report that DCF was supposed to file. And I would note that they were, uh, the commissioner, the deputy commissioner contacted me and others from their agency and invited the judiciary to come and look at Red Clover. And so we had a visit there. They provided me with information. And I shared it with the judges last night. And so we really appreciate uh, their openness and willingness to allow that. And in fact, uh, they also said that when we train new judges, uh, one of the components of our training will be having the new judges actually go to see the facility. And so uh, we appreciate them moving forward in that direction. But the policy decisions are once the legislature as to raise the age, pause, and how you're going to go forward. So I guess the, the question always is what impact to the court, if any, uh, of the- We're going to hear the case, whether it's in family or the criminal division. And I'm sure that we could try to come up with a case to say, well, if it's here, it might require more. But I think overall, uh, we will address the cases in whichever division the legislature takes us to. And we'll do it as best we can. So, so We've heard in the past that, you know, for example, having folks with mental health uh, dis problems or other um, chronic illnesses that when the court provides placement or services, sometimes those services are not available. And so community services then place pressure on the courts and, and, and offer some concerns. I'm wondering if there is any similar concern with uh, raise the age. So how to work with this younger population 
Um, is there a linkage between what you're doing and what community services are available or not available? It's, much of the difficulty we find comes from the, the pre-adjudication stage. And that is when someone comes in for conditions of release, we don't have uh, sometimes the community resources to be able to refer them to. And we'd like to get them the help they need, but we might not have someone to, somewhere to send them. Uh, when, whether it's in the adult court or the uh, juvenile court, the question really is, is there a strategy to get them the services they need through available services? And so if DCF is going to be working uh, with individuals, they can help them. If DOC is going to be working with individuals, they can help them. Uh, the courts are not a place where we have generally the ability to, to say, okay, you're going to go here for services. You know, conditions of release, we can try, but as you know, we, we have difficulty. Right, but you see the backup and you see the backlog. I mean, it's, a, it's a similar with uh, competency evaluation. We see the, you know, where do we place this person in the interim? So uh, maybe it's not time to have, uh, to see that yet with race to age, but are you I think it would be difficult to, yeah. to try to, to get the crystal ball out and say what's yeah. going to do. And that's why I think we have to approach it from the perspective of we currently deal with these cases in one of two places. Yeah. And we do the best we can with the available resources. And whatever of the two divisions it will be, and we're going to continue to do that. And if we think that there's additional resources that are necessary, we'll talk to our stakeholders and the other justice partners and and support them in trying to get the resources to effectuate what our common goal is. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Not seeing anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. And I just would note that Terry Corsones was on your list, but I didn't want you to think that she just blew you off today. Uh, there will be a new addition to the Corsones family. So she is oh, good. Oh, wow. She is a, uh, with a uh, family member today. And I, I keep checking my phone to see, but no announcement yet. But <laughs> I can't hold it against you that you didn't bring any cookies. You know. I was trying to get over there this morning, but I, I will tell her she, yeah. whether there's a new grandchild or not, they needed cookies. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So thank you, uh, Tim, for being here. And uh, over to you. Good to see you. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Tim Leaders, Dumont, Department of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I have to take over some child care uh, sharply at 245. So thanks for, for getting me in early. Um, yeah, so when the committee assistant reached out and, and um, uh, talked to me about looking for perspective from our department about this issue, I contacted our SAS, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, youth and juvenile practitioners that are in the courtrooms, the family courtrooms every day. As a bit of context, um, our department is experiencing caseloads of 350 to 360 cases per uh, attorney. Um, and often our juvenile and youth practitioners are carrying a criminal caseload as well. So they're co-managing really three dockets, the civil docket for PCRs, um, the family docket, and also the criminal docket. And occasionally we do find ourselves in probate court, but I'm not going to get into that. But technically, that's, that's a part of what we do as well occasionally. Um, one thing that you'll hear... Uh, in terms of some of what I'm going to say today, and I'm going to submit in writing uh, after um, today, um, some of the response I heard from the field is, I would say you will detect, um, having heard testimony from DCF Frontlines, a similarity uh, between DCF Frontline and law enforcement concerns and the SAS uh, practitioner Frontline. Um, this is in part due to our department's rather unique status in the Montpelier sphere, as being decentralized as to its decision making and policy and leadership structure. So my um, superiors, so to speak, are in 14 counties doing the work every day, um, and we really support that field. And so I try to best represent what they're experiencing um, from, from the field. And so um, the responses were collected to provide really direct response. Um, they don't necessarily represent the views of the department or even individual state's attorneys. Uh, but we think that there's value um, in the community's review of the topic and sort of hearing those things. I have removed <clears throat> names and county identifiers to maintain the confidentiality of Vermont's family court system while still providing an opportunity for you to, I would say, look under the hood of this area of practice. Um, so one uh, point of, of clarity that I always, I always do 
is with respect to the big offenses, we call it a big 14 now. 11 are really the original big 12 minus one, and three of them are now 16 and up only. Those three that uh, attorney Fitzpatrick spoke to you about. So those are 16 and up only, and then the original 11 are that younger age group up until the overlapping 16 and up population. But it's really a big, a big three and a big 11 that have some overlap. Um, the, the big 14 does not command nor mandate that our prosecutors keep those cases in the criminal division or even direct or even file them in the criminal division. We can directly file them into the family division. And so when you look at, as of March 1st, the 442 youthful offender cases that were pending, some subset of that youthful offender population are going to be big offenses. I haven't looked under the hood of those 442 uh, as of March 1, but some of those are going to be big offenses that were direct filed or that were later moved by stipulation or by other court process into YO status. Um, so I just wanted, there's, we could talk a lot about that, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I want to get right into the practitioner responses, and I'm just going to identify these as response number one, response number two, without other identifiers, if that's okay to proceed that way, um, Representative Lalonde. That's fine. Yeah, please. Um, so response number one. Um, I support the goals of raise the age, but at this point, 30% of my delinquency cases that come in are for those 18 and up. 30% is not a ballpark. I ran the numbers, and this is for one of our larger counties. Um, as of the cases submitted between July 1st, 2023, and June 30th, 2024, exactly 30% were 18 up. That population will continue to expand in terms of the percentage of the cases that are 18 plus that are in delinquency status or that are in delinquency um, definition uh, will continue to expand. So 30% for a fairly large county will continue to go up. And this just illustrates uh, the work that has occurred um, in terms of the first phase that Attorney Fitzpatrick spoke about and where it may expand going forward. Um, and that response number two, um, again, sort of with that disclaimer at the beginning that these are direct responses um, at no uh, fault of frontline DCF staff, but I have observed that DCF has not changed anything in their system, at least as far as I can tell, to account for the fact that they no longer just work with kids. The biggest problem I see is that DCF has not fully adapted or was not provided the resources to adapt. This is not to blame caseworkers, since this is clearly a management or Montpelier issue. But I feel that most FSWs do not want to be working with the 18 plus population. Instead, they push to close out cases and raise concerns. Um, the last point from response number two, having facilities and programs is wonderful. But at this point, I would settle for uh, youth and juvenile probation officers who are willing and supported to do the appropriate level of support for the 18 plus population. Response number three, rather than juvenile court, um, sorry, uh, and most, in many of the counties, the, the, the judges do a cite out, meaning you can cite out a case and you can determine that cite out time period, six weeks, eight weeks, four weeks, it sort of depends on the county. Um, but in one particular county, at least where this response came in, they have um, a limited amount of slots, about 12 slots each month for juvenile um, delinquency spaces. So if a case came in today, let's say that the April 1 um, deadline was was today and the case came in today, the first opportunity to fill one of those spots for someone up to age 20, 19 plus, would be November, late November. Um, so this will potentially add, the expansion of it may add to concerns related to um, tying the point of offense or concern with the first opportunity in court, which we know is important. Just wanted to, to add a little bit of nuance to that, that comment because it sort of depends on the county, but that was a fairly large county. Um, another response that came in was concern about law enforcement training. Um, I'm concerned about law enforcement training, implementing this new update as of April 1 of next year. I will need to go around to the various law enforcement agencies and do another juvenile training with this new update. We are not currently staffed to provide this level of training as such trainings often fall during the work week, et cetera. Just a commentary on that, our department does not have a training coordinator. We do not have uh, substantial amounts of training resources. So often what happens is the training kind of happens live in the field. Um, and it, I think that illustrates that, that point. Another response that came in, uh, one of the questions that we got was, how, what, what's the thought process for when a case goes to family or criminal court, um, if it fits into that overlapping category? 
And so this response was, from my perspective, it depends on the age of the juvenile, the type of crime, the facts and circumstances. And there are times where we can choose, as I was talking about earlier, depending on the charge, to send it either to criminal court for a big offense, directly to family court as a YO, or to juvenile court as a delinquency. An immediate example that comes to mind is a juvenile who is 16 and commits an aggravated assault or a fact pattern that fits the aggravated assault fact pattern. Let's say it's in the domestic context. We could do A, charge as a big offense as an aggravated assault and send the case to the criminal division or to the family division as a YO, or we could charge as first degree ag domestic in juvenile court. It's because domestics are not a part of the big offense list. In these cases where there are decisions of where and when to send, it typically depends on the facts I won't, I won't um, belabor that, but it would depend on the history of the individual. Um, and so that's an important factor that everyone has emphasized. Another important response. Um, oh, yes. I didn't know if you had a question. I'm sorry. No, I'm, gonna, keep going. yep, I'm trying to burn through these. And I will send these um, in writing as well, so you'll have them on the record. Um, oh, supports in the community. This goes to, I think, um, Representative Wood's comment and, Rep and Senator Lyons. Um, I know, at least here in County X, when trying to rehabilitate or assist with rehabilitation of a juvenile or a juvenile connected, uh, we try to get juveniles connected with resources as soon as possible, County X mental health, barge, et cetera. My understanding now is that without, even without raise the age phase two, our community resources are stretched thin with long waiting lists, um, even to get the initial screening. I wonder if anything has been done to ensure community supports are expanded and have enough resources to, to sustain a further expansion. <laughs> response number, um, next response. The simple version is that they have not, and I'm using they, just direct quote, they have not done the legislative work to make this a reality with success. They have neither the physical nor legal infrastructure to deal with this population and have not appropriated the resources necessary to achieve the stated goals. I would have no problem if this were another option for charging and disposition as structured raise the age creates barriers and delays for circumstances which do not comfortably fit in family court in all circumstances to account for safety and severity. Uh, another point that you'll hear is depending on the county and the judge, um, there are some counties where even for a big offense, and this is one way where raise the age potentially impacts even the big offenses, uh, there is a federal law that notes an 180-day detention limit, and some judges have interpreted that to apply to those that were charging as adults and big offenses. Other judges have taken a different approach, and so it's a little bit dependent on the, on the county and the judge. Uh, response number five. So that would mean even for a murder, for a big offense, um, it's possible that in some counties, the individual cannot be held, um, let's say after April 1, a 19-year-old cannot be held for more than six months, even if they were being held without bail under um, Constitution and, and Title 13. Uh, next response, I do not think we're ready for raise the age. It requires the right amount of resource to be able to serve this age group. DCF needs access to a secure facility to place juveniles. It's not a lot of cases, but when the cases arise, it's important um, because something has happened and there's a public safety risk, at least in terms of the reasons that we would potentially have some overlap with that. Um, and th the rest of these, I'll, I'll, I'll probably just send to you the final one I wanted to mention because it has to do with a little bit of data that one of the counties got back to me with, it has to do with aging out, which is when you age out of the juvenile system. Um, and some of the obstacles that we run into in terms of what happens there. So um, this is a response to me uh, in the central office. But Tim, as you know, I keep track of my cases and report statistics. In 2020, when raised the age occurred, halfway into the year to 18-year-olds, zero cases aged out of jurisdiction without case resolution. In 2021, two cases aged out of jurisdiction without resolution. In 2022, four cases aged out without case resolution one with a pending arrest warrant. In 2023, eight cases raised, aged out without jurisdiction, uh, one with a pending arrest warrant. I have not done the analysis yet for 2024. It will only get worse when we add 19-year-old individuals to the delinquency roster. Before you go on, uh, Tim, yep. ex explain what aged out means. So dependent what, what on, uh, yeah, so dependent on whether they're under the delinquency status or a youthful offender, there is a maximum age upon which jurisdiction applies. So 
one of the two is six six months past 21, I believe, and there might be someone in the room that can correct me. And the other one is, I don't live and breathe this every day, which is why I'm providing you some of this. And the other one is six months past maybe 22 or, or, or maybe one year after 21. I can't remember the exact, but basically they reach a certain age and then the family court no longer has jurisdiction. Um, and so what often ends up happening is the cases essentially get dismissed. Um, and without having that accountability factor. And we're dealing with a population where in many other contexts, they're legal adults. But here, so there isn't a parent for like a 14-year-old, right, who's bringing them there or a guardian. Um, for the 18, 19, they might be living in an apartment by themselves. They might be without a house. Um, they might be, you know, having other levels of issues in the community. So sometimes, and, and sometimes it's at no fault of the young person, and sometimes it is, it is, purposeful, they're aging out, and we're not able to really assist in that rehabilitative process under Title 33. Um, and we have so many other cases, you know, happening in our court system, these, these things are not being uh, addressed by the time they are no longer under the jurisdiction of the family division. Right, thank you. Yep. Uh, and I'm getting towards the end here, I promise. Uh, one of the reasons that the legislature gives for the purpose of raise the age historically has been to protect young people in the raise the age category from the consequences of a criminal record. And we've discussed that this morning, but this is already accomplished in some respects under the expungement provisions under Title 33 DSA 5, Section 5119, which allows for expungement of any crime except listed offenses that are committed prior to age 25. Um, and so there is other provisions that allow for some of the same goals. Um, and that actually extends up to age uh, 25 in that context. Um, and the other, piece here that I think it's in, important to note is that we deal with the victims of crime in our department. And so this is an inc this is a complex and difficult area to work with victims because of the confidentiality that exists in family court. And so from the perspective that we've heard from some of our victim advocates, it's a very, it's, a, it's some of our more difficult cases because we're not able to, um, uh, because, because it's confidential, the victim advocates are slightly more limited, right? And what they can talk about outside the courtroom to, to a great degree to uh, protect the rehabilitative pathway that Title 33 allows. But when it's a serious felony, that's a non-big offense, it can be something quite serious, like a domestic, um, you know, between people living together uh, who are 18 years old. So that can be very complex. And I don't need to probably belabor that for you to imagine your own scenarios where that could be really difficult to work with a victim about why the case is in the family division. And when we try to transfer those up, which we're allowed to attempt to try to do a non big offense from family to criminal, it can take a long time. We've, we've heard some of these take over a year. So during that time period, the individual is not subject to criminal conditions of release and is not subject to things like bail if they're not showing up for court. Um, and so that kind of abuts and it runs up against the age out piece because that is also a clock ticking against when we're able to engage in the family division. Um, I hope that some of this was helpful. Um, and the last piece that I'll end with because it came up earlier was about recidivism in Vermont, in terms of recidivism and statute, it's only applying to individuals who are sentenced to more than one year of incarceration. Do not have to tell anybody that's working in this realm that many, many, many sentences are not for over a year or not for a year. So recidivism only applies to a population in terms of the adult population that is incarcerated for over one year. And then after release returns to prison within three years. So if you committed 10 retail thefts were sentenced to a total of 10 days, and you did that 10 times throughout the year, you would not be recidivist in our definition under Vermont statute. Uh, that's really the conclusion of my remarks. I hopefully was was quick. You, you were quick, and, and I could probably spend two days uh, piecing through what you've uh, talked to us and probably will in, in January. Um, any questions, any other questions for uh, Tim? Besides the dozen or so I have, but won't ask at this point. I'll, I'll submit this um, once I get it cleaned up. I was getting responses five minutes before <laughs> I, I started talking. I'll submit everything to the committee assistant at the conclusion. All right, thanks a lot, Tim. All right, so I don't believe we have uh, Marshall here, but uh, so I think and Joshua, do you want a chance to weigh in and uh, Great. We're just going to share the data. 
if that works. Um, no, sure. But so I think, yeah, maybe it's a matter of whether we have particular questions. This is the data that you shared. Uh, so rather than go over what we've probably looked at, maybe, yeah, why don't you join us and if we have any questions. Um, and I think the main question that jumps out at me is I can't really tell what this means regarding 19-year-olds. I I noticed that, and I think the more folks are, uh, for the record, Dr. Rutherford, facility operations manager with the Department of Corrections. Uh, I noticed that, and I think the more that we went through testimony today, the more apparent it became that we need to break that down a little narrower for us. Um, you did look at, I did do a point in time this morning on 19 year olds specifically. Um, that is not totally unique individuals in the calendar year. How many we have in custody right now? Um, as of this morning, there are seven 19 year olds um, who are incarcerated in the state of Vermont for Vermont charges. Um, if raise the age was in effect, the next phase was in effect today. Um, four of those would still be with us, and three of them would not. So, go ahead. Well, of those four that would still be with you, would that have to be sight and sound? Except so that that is a complication um, with raise the age, and yes and no. Um, so anybody under eighteen, regardless of raise the age, is going to have to be sight and sound separating their unit under pre guidelines. Um, they can have contact outside of their unit while supervised with adults, but they have to be sight and sound separating the unit. That is a challenge because we very often have one or two of those folks and they are pretty isolated. Um, for individuals who are over 18 um, and are not at the age of full criminal responsibility, which in Vermont right now is 19, and your proposer in April will become 20, um, they have to be sight and sound separated until they have an interest of justice hearing. At the interest of justice hearing, the court can determine whether or not to allow them to have contact with adults. Thus far, every 18-year-old that we have had, um, the court has chosen to allow them to have contact with adults because the alternative is generally a pretty significant degree of segregation or separation. Uh, I have four 18-year-olds right now as of this morning in custody. Um, and so if one or two of those were in sight and sound separation, it would be one or two. Um, and they'd be away from it. And there's just more opportunity to access services uh, and access them in a more normal environment uh, if they're living in general population. We have to do some things to be careful about, obviously, potentially vulnerabilities, making sure they're safe, um, but they just have a more normalized experience and a lot more ability to socialize with peer and engage in services in a normal environment um, if they're in population. Other questions? Um, go ahead. Talk I, I, I have a question. It, it's kind of an overall question dealing with the people that are involved in this um, raise the age. Um, and it's probably a question for the commissioner. How many of these individuals are developmentally disabled? I don't know the answer to that, Representative. Because they're going to take, it's going to take a different kind of uh, service. Providing different kinds of services. Sure. It's required in their report. It's a required element of the report. Is it in the, the, the last report? I, I cannot recall, to be perfectly honest, but. Um, so I should. We should, we should check the report. If it's not there, then we have thanks, to check it. Thanks for the yeah. <laughs> so, so I just have a general question and, and goes beyond, but it's it, whenever we uh, get data from uh, DOC, it's this point in time. Yeah. Where are you going with data so that you could <laughs> perhaps tell me how many 19 year olds have been incarcerated for how much time over a period of time? Is that is that anywhere in the future for the um, that I understand is being updated? Our, our, our data team is continually increasing what they can do, but I'm not the best one to speak to that. Okay. Um, point in time is one of the easiest things for us to grab. Um, some of the other increase we can get, they were able to give us the the full number of unique individuals in a calendar year, right. which obviously isn't a point in time. Right. Um, but but it is a challenge to measure groups versus a lot of our data is very individualized. Okay, all right, thank you. I just thought I'd ask you. One thing I did want to just point out to these numbers because it's such, such an aberration is the racial demographics of this younger age group. Um, both in both calendar year 22 and 23, approximately 50% of the individuals who are 21 or under in our custody were white. For our total incarcerated population, that percentage is more like 88 or 89%. So, 
So you have significantly more people of color involved um, when we start talking with this younger age group. And I'm not sure as the reason for that, um, but it leaps out to us from the data. And I think anytime we start talking about um, discrepancies, identifying that they're there is the first step to figuring out why and what we do about that. All right, I think that's all the witnesses we have because uh, Martha was not able to make it, but uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate all the folks you spoke longer than I did for, for letting us dig in there no, a little bit. No, it's your bailiwick, not mine. <laughs> and Bob. And, and Bob's. <laughs> and not Erwin. Okay, we've got, a, we've got one more item, folks. I hope we can get through this a little quick, quickly, I'm not sure. Um, I know this room is warm, and I know one of the reasons why the state house is so warm is there's work being done on the HVAC. Uh, and I don't know if it would help to open up the door at all. I get some air. Yes, because they're working on the HVAC. Okay. It's warm outside. So we've got. Um, at our next meeting, we really need to make a decision on how we apply earn time in DOC to um, keep the door open. Um, be it expanded to different statuses of uh, when we close it, it's going to be two yes. level. And um, whether we have requirements for people. If we do it. Security alert. Security alert. Hospital insurers in the building. Law enforcement is responding to this event. Remain in a safe location and wait for further instructions. Mm -hmm. Should we lock our door? Yes, yeah, lock, lock, lock the door. door. Yeah, I was we're supposed to close the windows too. Yeah, close the windows. We'll see. Well, we have to Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Now, I locked the door. I don't do that. I don't do I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I do I don't do that. I do Lock the door again. I unlocked it, but now we relock it. And then there will be a false alarm. We hope. Yeah. And we should put <laughs> Let's do it. I'll look to your lawyer. <laughs> Let's put that. Let's put that. That was Jay. Yeah, it was Jay. That was Jay Hooper. I mean, you're pointing at this Jay Hooper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was there should okay, be no, no false alert. alarm. There should be a security alert whenever Jason should be having a person yeah. on our phone. Oh, I'm sorry. We yeah, there is, an, <laughs> there, is a, there is a security alert on my phone. Is there anything on your phone? No, no, no. Come on, alert would do this, right? Should the alert, the alert should it be theoretical? Theoretical. Are on that system. Oh, on that. Out. A lot of sign. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Megan. I haven't heard of any. Well, let's keep going. So for earn time, we already have a structure in place. And, and I think for the committee, you need to understand the current structure that's in place and how it works in DOC before we can make any recommendations next month that we're going to have to make. Because by the middle of November, we will had to have a recommendation given. So I'd like to make the recommendation at our next meeting, if possible. So I'm turning it over to Ben. He's got lots of documents. And uh, it's all yours, Ben. A really good way to scare people off. What? The introduction. This is Ben. He has lots of documents. 
it. Um, <laughs> but some of that was medical stuff. Right. We're not right. going to need all that. Uh, so for the record, Ben Novogrodsky from the Ottawa Legislative Council. And don't be scared uh, off by my documents. The only one that really, if you want, as a quick reference, is sort of my memo that I wrote to committee. And then the other ones about the, the earned uh, good time rule um, that's from POC. Uh, the facility rules, um, an inmate discipline, um, and then the statute are just for context uh, if you don't want to go back to the sources themselves. Um, so it's not that scary. Um, so don't get it confused because there's also the medical piece we're going to deal yeah, with in our October meeting. So you got two documents that are the medical piece, but you don't need to look at it. Oh, so you save those till next meeting. But you got three documents for earn time. Right. So to get into earn time generally, I mean, it's really this, this concept that if a offender is well behaved, uh, they can have seven days per month of good behavior subtracted from their minimum or maximum sentences um, and maximum sentences, excuse me. And what that involves is one, they cannot be adjudicated of a major disciplinary rule violation during that time and not reincarcerated uh, from the reincarcerated, excuse me, from the community for a violation of their release conditions. Um, and this makes an exception for someone that loses housing sort of at no fault of their own. Um, and that may have been a condition of release. So they're, that they're safe if that were to occur. But those are the two main requirements for someone to be uh, to earn good time. Um, and a major disciplinary rule violation, um, according to DOC's directives, there are two categories, major A and major B. Um, major A is sort of the <laughs> ultimate things that constitute violent acts or serious threats to institutional security or personal safety. And major B are basically serious instances of misconduct that don't rise to that level of major A. Um, and I should say that uh, a major disciplinary rule violation, so it has to be adjudicated, meaning it's not currently pending and not subject to appeal. So it has to be a final ruling. Um, so those who are pending uh, adjudication aren't yet, don't meet the, the criteria for it. So are there any questions about the general criteria for earning good time? Now, who's not eligible for good time? Um, offenders who are on probation, offenders on parole, offenders who are, who are sentenced to serve an interrupted sentence, so one that is not served continuously in intervals, or those that are sentenced to work through, which is now back as a sentencing option um, after last session, offenders sentenced to life without parole, and offenders serving a disqualifying offense, which is defined in the statute as murder, voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, lewd and lascivious conduct with a child, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated sexual assault with, with uh, of a child. So those are offenses that disqualify people, even if they meet the criteria um, from being eligible for good time. Uh, so any questions on the ineligible folks? Folks know the difference of furlough and parole? We're getting to that too. The folks know Josh, the I just want to make sure that you understand that disqualifying offenses are only um, if one was serving on them on January 1st of 2021. Right. So if somebody was sentenced today, there are no disqualifying offenses. It's only for those who are already serving. Um, right. Okay. So and that's a long important, history there. That's right. an important yeah. distinction. Yeah, because there are certain retroactivity principles that we have to be mindful of when we're drafting legislation. And so it was only forward looking that it would apply to and not those that um, in the past. So thank you, Josh. <laughs> um, there is an exception for residential treatment. So an offender in a post adjudication residential setting uh, for substance use treatment is eligible to earn a reduction of one day off their sentence for each day they receive their inpatient treatment. Um, and that's the only type of earn time that that particular type of offender can earn. 
And then um, there are notifications and record keeping requirements. So a lot of this falls on DOC that they provide notification to victims of records about A, the existence of the program itself, as long as informing them of the option to receive notification from the department for any changes um, to an offender's scheduled release. So basically, if they are earning good time, um, every time their sentence um, is lowered, they're, if the person has opted in to receive those services. Yeah, yeah. Let's close the door. Yeah. I mean, security alert. Security alert. Immediately investigate their violent conduct. Security alert. Security alert. Immediately investigate their violent conduct. Okay, well, welcome back, folks. That was a false alarm for what anyone out there that's watching. We have confirmed that the system is being tested by the Capitol Police and it has been false alarms, but we did act as we. So let's quickly get back to earn time. Yeah, and so then the final portion is just notice and record keeping. Um, DOC also has to provide timely notice, not less frequently than 90 days to offenders who receive a reduction in their term. And then DOC has to maintain a, a system that documents and records all earned time reductions in each offender's permanent record. Um, and, and again, um, you know, the big question is, well, why are we doing this? Why are we talking about earned time right now? Um, and if you look at the PowerPoint from the, the first meeting, one of the things that this committee has to do is review the current earned time program and whether it should be expanded to include parolees, as was a topic of discussion in the House Corrections and Institution uh, Committee from this past session, um, as well as permitting earned time for educational credits for both offenders and parolees. Um, and again, because parolees are not currently included in the earned time program. Um, and then a second portion of this review concerns the DOC's victim notification system to examine its current operation and effectiveness and whether it has the capabilities to handle any such expansion to include either educational credits um, or to parolees under the current program. Um, and then that, that testimony needs to include the DOC, Center for Crime Victim Services, victims and survivors of crimes, including those who serve on the center's uh, advisory council, and the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So that's the, the focus of the committee um, as it's going through the review of the program is should it be expanded to parolees and then should ex educational credits be a new program offered to both parolees and sentence offenders and basically can the victim notification system handle the speech? Mm -hmm. Oh, we need lots of time yeah. on this. And, and, you know, my committee spent a tremendous amount of time on this because the thinking was if you could incentivize, right now what's, what is happening within DOC is... Go down that rabbit hole of presumptive parole because we've got that going on too. But what is happening is parole is under the parole board. It is not under DOC. DOC supervises. Furlough is under DOC. So when earn time was put in, because furlough is still under DOC and they're considered incarcerated, though outside the walls in the community, they should qualify for earn time. The same as for folks who are incarcerated. Parole is a different situation because it's up to the parole board to make those decisions if someone is paroled. 
what is has been happening is people are not wanting to go on parole. They want to go more on furlough so they can get earned time. They're not getting earned time on parole. Furlough and parole would only be effective or eligible once a person's met their minimum. So the thinking was from some of our colleagues is if we could offer incentives for folks to receive earned time or earn extra time off their sentence if they're involved in an educational program, a college program, my committee started talking about apprenticeships, internships <clears throat> to get back in the workforce. Well, the initial thinking is, well, you could do that just for folks who are on parole. Once you start looking at it, well, why wouldn't that be offered to folks who are on furlough? Why wouldn't that be offered to folks who are in question? So it kind of has this domino effect of something that may look simple on the surface mm -hmm. gets really, really complicated when you get down to the nuance. Um, so then it was kind of left for us to make a recommendation how if we expand earn time, number one, do we do it? Do we expand it? Do we expand it to those on parole? Do we do it with <clears throat> having some educational credits available so they might earn a little bit more time? Work opportunities, apprenticeships, and turn interns. <clears throat> and then the other piece, of course, is the victim no notification piece, because in earn time, what's really the issue is in the victim arena, they are sentenced and they are sentenced for X amount of years in the min and X amount for a max. And then you calculate in earn time, their sentence is going to be less, which then raises the anxiety level of many victims. So then if we expand earn time to more categories, what does that do to a person who is a victim. So we got a lot of layers. But what it, and, and the other thing, if we do expand anything, DOC is going to have to update their rules. Or is it a directive or a rule? No, it's a, it's a rule. It's a rule. It's an administrative rule. So they're going to have to update <clears throat> all of that. So that's what's before us. Um, when you say if we do expand it, is this committee actually expanding it or sending it back to the committee jurisdiction? Okay. It's a recommendation. We're not, we don't have the authority to expand. Yeah, essentially what was decided is to have the committee explore to kind of keep momentum behind the idea. Um, now, there was a, a bill drafted or a version of a bill. I don't know if that's something you want me to bring to the next what we did in my committee right yeah. about the educational credits and then all that it didn't necessarily address you know it's just a way to to do it not the way so mm -hmm. we will get some testimony on this we're gonna have to get a lot of that's why i wanted the to, numbers yeah. the and, i don't know the victim resource center we're gonna hear yeah, from somebody there Jen. And then um, and specific reference. the resources available to oversee and help implement. And the parole board. And the parole board. Yeah. And I just want to clarify the, the portion where Josh was helping me out. So it was um, offenders that are serving a disqualifying offense after 2021 don't earn good time. Before then, they, they could have. And now how do we do that? How do we do that? Because that was the... No. It's in the statute. Uh, that done? It was, yeah. I think mm -hmm. the issue was the issue was when we first put earn time in place, regardless of what the offense was, anyone that was incarcerated on furlough, except for the big 12. No, but it, it, it was everybody. It was everybody. And yeah. then the victim community was really upset because they said, wait a minute, this person was sentenced eight years ago, and this is what the sentence is, now you've changed the rules, rule of the game, and particularly for these offenses. So we spent the session in 21, we were all on Zoom, trying to figure out. So I think it was when it was effective. Yes. So the law became effective going forward, anyone who was on those statuses. Right, so what, Jesse, 
team of the bill. Yeah. But it said very specifically, if you are sentenced for one of those disqualifying offenses on January 1, 2021, you shall not earn any earned time sentences reductions under the, the section after the effective date. Subdivision 5, which is um, that the provisional reading from should not be construed to limit or affect earned time that an offender has earned on or before the effective date of the act. So, so they like, wouldn't lose their earned time. Right, they got like four or five months. Right, but going mean, forward. But going forward, if they were serving, they wouldn't. But then again, anybody sentenced after that, and I believe the thought was that for somebody sentenced after that, the victim could be made aware, the court would be aware that this sentence that you're imposing may actually be less. And while I wasn't there during that time, the other issue that I could see is that there's a due process issue here. Uh, since people were essentially potentially meeting the requirements of the earned time program prior to it being effect. So why would they be excluded as opposed to others? So there is a little bit, and that's something that this committee and the committee of jurisdiction will probably have to deal with. If you just- For those carve outs, for the carve outs? Parolees, parolees especially, it's more of a significant issue, I would imagine, than, than sentence offenders because they have a different status. They're subject to the rules of the parole board. Right. So that's what we're going to have to do. <clears throat> but people need to understand just the basic fundamentals of burden time that they receive seven days, not up to, but they receive seven days a month, provided they don't have a major DR. Basically. And they haven't violated their conditions. They haven't violated their conditions while they're out on furlough. So that would, that would track if we expand it to parolees. But the ultimate decision if the person's pulled back into a correctional facility or not, it's up to the parole board, not the OC. Uh, what happens if a uh, person's uh, earned time and then they uh, reoffend? Does any of that earned time, they lose it all or they count? Uh, they burned it. So if they reoffend, it's a new it's a different case, case and they could have a new sentence. So if they're on parole. Yeah, but right now, earned time doesn't affect parole. So this would all be things. Oh, I'm, I'm, okay. But if they're work. on furlough. But if they're on furlough, oh, right. because you can't, you can't kind of use one case to adjudicate another. You know, they're, they're kind of separate. Yeah. So they would, they would have, if they have a new charge, it's a new offense, they have a new charge, they still have their current conviction and sentence that they have to carry through. And then they're going through the process for a new charge. Now that new charge, they could be held as a detainee or they could be out on conditions. And, and if they're sentenced for that new charge, kind of their behavior from the past can be factored into that new sentence, but it can't be done the other way around. And then- so, so I'm, they, thinking of, I'm thinking of a person that uh, offends while they're on furlough. Mm -hmm. So doesn't it revert back to the sentence they had? No. No, it's a new charge, it's a new crime, it'll be a new sentence. Right, so, so under they, that, they would be arranged yeah. separately for that. They're arranged separately, it's a separate conviction. So they could be serving two sentences. One sentence could be for 10 years. Another sentence could be for five. They could be serving that consecutively or concurrently. That's where it gets really confusing when you're looking at DOC now. Yeah. So once you earn that time, essentially, you, it, it's you, can't, take away. you can't take away earned time. Once it's been earned. Yeah, and that goes back to that due process issue. It's really complicated. So you think it's easy to expand it to parole? It's mm -hmm. not. And you may think it's really easy just to say, well, for some incentive for people to succeed while they're on parole, if they're involved in an educational program, let's up the amount that they've earned on earn time. But then if you don't do that for folks who are on furlough, or incarcerated, you've got a population that you're treating differently. Yeah, you have due process or even equal protection issues. So it got really complicated, so we punted to us. <laughs> <laughs> and a quick, a quick sort of primer on what this 
what's kind of colloquially known as learned time, not earned time for the education credits is that you get a certain amount reduced off your sentence to say if you got a, a trade certificate or maybe some more if you got a bachelor's degree degree, or even more if you got a master's or, or a professional degree. So that's kind of the idea behind the educational credits is that if you've essentially used your time either in prison or under the auspices of DOC um, productively by getting a degree or getting some training, that's something that should be credited to, towards your sentence. That's the general idea. We're going to have to spend some time on this next week, next month. Our meeting next month is the 16th of October, 16th, right? 16th. So we bumped out Medicaid waiver as well as the health care. So we're going to do that. And we're going to have to um, testimony on earn time, which would be from the victim's community, Jen and the parole board, which is George, the chair, and, and he's asked, so Tim again. Mary, Mary, Mary Ann Ainsworth, Mary, 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 Mary Ainsworth, and the OC. Okay. And Tim, and PSAS, they're involved in that too. Tim, good mom. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, state's a okay. So we're going to have to spend a lot of time on that one. Do you want me to bring in or at least submit the, yes. the previous bill version? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a good start. Because we may need the November meeting to make further recommendations, recommendations discussions, questions. So, Marshall, you came in. Yeah. What do you want to do here, folks? I need to leave. I need to leave. Okay, and we'll go over our schedule to see what other things we may need to do, but I think the medical thing is going to take a long time. No, I mean, from a purely not the Medicaid waiver, but understanding what we've put in place the prescription and opioid use coverage. Yeah, because we've put in quite a bit in place. As far as committee work that needs to be done, it's only the pretrial supervision stuff, which the committee's already voted upon, and then the earn time issue. The rest are either reports that are submitted um, and then you digest and kind of do, do what you do. Um, and then anything else that you'd like to bring to the table. So I don't want to have this cramped schedule next time, but no, we okay. should get it really done. You want to do the other time first and then the medical? Did we try to also have well pad around? Yes. For the medical? Yes. Okay, anything else for trusting? Thank you. Anything else?